happening, everybody, on today's show? A little bit of a crossover edition. We'll catch up with our buddy Zach Blackerby, host of Locked on Auburn. We'll talk about the aftermath of Auburn losing the uh, Birmingham Bowl to Houston and where they go from here. Will T.J. Finley be the quarterback next year? Can Austin Davis turn around Auburn next year in that offense? We'll discuss all of that. Also, we'll go around the conference as Alabama and Georgia continue to prepare for their semifinal games on Friday. Tennessee playing their big bowl game today, as well as South Carolina. We got a new OC at Ole Miss and plenty other hires locked on SEC starts right now. You are locked on SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's happening, everybody? Welcome into Locked On SEC. Great to have you guys along. Today's episode is brought to you by NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. Head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end of your financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. I'm Chris Gordy. Thanks for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Remember, Locked on SEC is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube and at LockedOnSEC.com. Let's jump into it. Let's go around the conference. Boots out to the right. Makes the handoff. Around the conference. Tennessee announced they will be without one of their starters today in the Music City Bowl against Purdue. Josh Heupel announcing that right tackle Cade Mays will not play, will not be available for the game due to an ankle injury. Mays traveled with the team to Nashville, but that ankle injury still bothering him. He was injured during the last two games of the regular season. The hope was that he could play. Now Jeremiah Crawford and Dane Davis will step in for Mays at right tackle. Over at Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin has his next offensive coordinator. That's according to Matt Sennett's of On3 Sports. Kiffin is expected to reach into the past and hire Charlie Weiss Jr. for the vacant position. Kiffin and Weiss, who is now 28, they worked together at FAU in 2018 and 2019. Kiffin hired Weiss to run his offense in Boca Raton. Weiss then moved on to USF as the OC and quarterbacks coach the past two seasons. Weiss was also an analyst at Alabama in 2015 and 2016 when Lane Kiffin was there. Weiss, of course, is the son of former Patriots offensive coordinator and Florida OC at one time, uh, Charlie Weiss. Weiss will replace the outgoing Jeff Lebby, who took the same position at his alma mater, Oklahoma. Kiffin obviously has a comfort level with Weiss running the offense. And, of course, Lane Kiffin, the offense will always default back to him whenever he wants to uh, override, make a decision. So good hire for Ole Miss. We'll see how it works out for them. Several teams have been struggling with COVID issues all across the bowl season. And Kirby Smart at Georgia credits the Bulldogs medical staff for keeping his team safe. He said, look, we've had protocols in place throughout the year. We probably weren't as strict earlier in the year. But when our staff saw that things were starting to spike, we increased sensitivity to that. He's done a tremendous job leading up to the SEC championship game and now leading up to the semifinal monitoring what's going on. Meanwhile, over at Alabama, Nick Saban has made it a point to keep his players aware of everything going on and locked in ahead of their Cotton Bowl game against Cincinnati on Friday. During his radio show on Wednesday night, Nick Saban said that their players voted to not leave the team hotel. He said, look, you're not going to remember what you did on Tuesday night in Dallas three months from now three weeks from now or three years from now. But you will remember for the rest of your life what happens in this semifinal game. So Nick Saban taking the uh, Bud Kilmer approach, saying, shut it all down, boys. No fun. We're going to be completely focused on this game. Nobody's going anywhere and ain't nobody tested positive for anything. Meanwhile, over at LSU, Kayshawn Boutte has been the subject of some rumors, possibly hitting the transfer portal especially with Brian Kelly taking over, a lot of new faces. But the former five-star wide receiver put those rumors to rest with an announcement on Twitter on Wednesday, tweeting out, ignore the rumors, I'm locked in. Butte was LSU's leading receiver this year with 38 catches for over 500 yards and nine touchdowns. 2020, he was a freshman All-American, set the SEC record for receiving yards in a game in the season finale against Ole Miss. 
The season ended in mid-October after he suffered a leg injury at Kentucky. Coming out of high school, he was a five-star prospect, the number two wide receiver coming out of high school. Meanwhile, over at Auburn, their season came to a disappointing end on Tuesday as they lost to Houston in the Birmingham Bowl. It was the Tigers' fifth straight loss after that 6-2 and two start in Brian Harson's first year. But they did get some good news yesterday. Defensive lineman Colby Wooden, who contributed four tackles in the loss, his third-year sophomore, had a nice season. He announced his plans for next season, and he announced he was coming back to Auburn. He said, I'll never forget how the best fans in the nation had Jordan Hare rocking. Nothing better than feeling the electricity in the air of 90,000 and being suited up with my brothers going to war with them. I guess what I'm trying to say is let's run it back. So we will see what uh, he is uh, able to provide on that D-line moving forward in Colby Wooden. Following the loss uh, to the Houston Cougars, Auburn quarterback T.J. Finley took to Instagram and tweeted out a message for Auburn fans and said, time to get better. We'll discuss what the future of the Auburn quarterback position looks like coming up in the next segment with Zach Blackerby. Meanwhile, over at Mississippi State, they're still licking their wounds after their blowout loss in the Liberty Bowl to Texas Tech. And yesterday, kicker Brandon Ruiz made an announcement after two seasons in Starkville, transferring into Mississippi State from Arizona State. Ruiz has opted to declare for the NFL draft. He was with the Sun Devils 2017 and 2018. He missed just one extra point in 95 tries during that span. Sat out the 2019 season due to transfer rules. It's perfect 24 for 24 and extra points in 2020. Also converted 10 of his 12 field goal tries. So we will see uh, what Ruiz does at the next level. Meanwhile, over at LSU, Brian Kelly, he's reaching back into the NFL to hire yet another defensive assistant. He hired his defensive coordinator, Matt House, just two days ago. And now he's announced the hiring of Minnesota Vikings special teams coach Robert Steeples. No specific uh, announcement on what position Steeples will coach. He's a former NFL cornerback and played his college ball at Missouri and Memphis. Meanwhile, over at Arkansas, they're getting ready for their Outback Bowl against Penn State on Saturday, and they'll be without all SEC wide receiver Traylon Burks, who we know has already opted out. Sam Pittman talking with the media this week about the loss of Burks. He said, look, he was our go-to guy. I understand the situation, but losing him, we lose a lot of our offense, and he was a great leader for us. Despite the locks, Pittman says Burks uh, forced the other receivers to step up. Said, how can we replace him? It's going to take a lot of people to replace him. So we will see what they do there. Meanwhile, over at Kentucky, Mark Stoops and his crew looking to Will Levis coming back. Will Levis, of course, announced his intention to come back to Kentucky rather than going pro. And this week, talking with 24-7 Sports, Levis said, I know I have a lot more to improve on as a player, as well as I think there's a lot of great opportunities for this team next year. We have some developing to do, and I think if we can play to our full potential with all the guys coming back, we're bringing in some transfers, it will be a recipe for success. So looking forward to having a good offseason and an even better year next season. Over at Vanderbilt, Clark Lee making a couple additions to his staff. Larry Black, who spent the last three seasons as Toledo's defensive line coach, he is heading to Nashville to be their D-line coach at Vanderbilt. And also, according to a report by Bruce Feldman, Lee will be adding former Virginia assistant Nick Howell to be the Commodore's defensive backs coach. Howell spent the last six seasons with the Cavaliers, working for Bronco Mendenhall. He's 41 years old, served as EB's coach and uh, certainly will help Vanderbilt in the secondary. Tennessee and Josh Heupel, they will have to replace a member of their staff. All senior offensive analyst Matt Merritt is leaving Tennessee to go be running backs coach at Georgia Southern. Merritt will be form- joining former USC head coach Clay Helton over at Georgia Southern as he continues to build out his staff. And lastly, Football Writers Association of America named the finalists for the Steve Spurrier First Year Coach Award. Two of them coming from the SEC. One of them, a former SEC guy, Gus Meldzahn at UCF, Josh Heupel at Tennessee, and Shane Beamer at South Carolina, all named finalists for the award, which will be given to the best coach in his 
first year at a new school. So it'll be interesting to see who wins that. Thank you guys again for making Locked On SEC your first listen every day. Coming up next, Zach Blackerby will join us. We'll do a little bit of a crossover edition, host of Locked On Auburn. We'll talk all things about the Auburn Tigers and some other SEC topics as well. That is next. Look, this is it, guys. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. If you want to see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. They got visibility and control of your financials. Uh, as well as your inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more. NetSuite is everything you need to grow your business all in one place. 93% of businesses surveyed increased their visibility and control after they upgraded to NetSuite. Over 28,000 businesses are already using NetSuite for the new year. NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked. Just go to NetSuite, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E, dot com slash locked l-o-c-k-e-d for the special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses netsuite.com slash locked and joining us now a little locked on crossover action locked on auburn of course locked on sec chris gordy the host man how are you doing uh you survived christmas excited for the new year yeah, man, it's uh, it's an exciting time, although not trending very well so far for the SEC in their bowl games. So uh, we need to need to find some more wins, get back in the win column here. But uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. The games have been entertaining so far. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that Auburn Houston one it was entertaining, but man, from an Auburn perspective, the offense it was it was tough to watch. Gordy, you and I texted a little bit while it was going on. And you sent me a text, and, and, and I wanted to have a conversation about it, but you just sent me a text, and all it said was, TJ Finley has regressed. And I was kind of in the Finley camp when he transferred. I thought I was going to be a big addition to the Auburn quarterback's room. And what we've seen since Bo Nix has been injured is not good. It is not a good version of TJ Finley. Yeah, and, and look, I'm a little bit different. You know, I used to host a radio show in New Orleans, and so, um, you know, I have buddies who coach at Ponchatoula, who went to Ponchatoula, and and they used to send me clips of this kid. I mean, when he was just a, a junior in high school saying, check out Jamarcus Russell 2.0. Like, that was the kind of the joke because he was this big, right. tall guy with a big arm who could fling it down the field. And so, you know, when, when we found out he was going to be coming to LSU, it was like, man, this kid is going to be a stud. And so, you know, he was really good in high school. Once he got to LSU, obviously there was a log jam with quarterbacks, but with injuries, Miles Brennan and all that, he was forced into early action. And I thought the thing that stood out to me, at least through his first, you know, first couple starts at at LSU was how poised he was. Like the kid didn't get rattled. Um, You know, his first start, I think, was against South Carolina. They hung 50 points on a Will Muschamp defense. Right. That was, like, encouraging. And then the next week, he goes and lays an egg at Auburn. Of course, they get blown out. It was, like, 48 to 10 or something. But, you know, at least uh, through through those starts for TJ Finley, you you saw moments. You saw pieces of the big arm and all that. And so when he transferred to Auburn this offseason, I said, man, you know, um, his thought was, I want to go somewhere where I can pe- compete for the starting job. And it just didn't make sense because it was like, well, do you really think you're going to beat out Bo Nix? Like, he's been there a couple of years. He's already, you know, he's the heir apparent. He's the guy. And so Finley going there was a little odd. And then we saw, obviously, moments throughout this year and then Bo Nix getting hurt. You know, Finley finally gets his chance. And I just wondered, like, did they coach him up? But Like, did Mike Bobo even talk to this guy? Did they even, like go through any drills or anything because what we saw of tj finley this year was just man a lot of not great i mean uh the georgia state game obviously the 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 great drive to and that game was yeah. was great but outside of that man i mean i saw a lot of mediocrity a lot of you know the the iron bowl and i hate to pin it on him because obviously tank bigsby and you know there was blame to go all around but like man if he just makes one or two more good throws they win that iron bowl they should have won that iron bowl and then the birmingham bowl i mean again like like watching passes go either too high or too low and i'm like man like somebody pull this kid aside shake him and go relax my man relax and i know 
you know, you don't have the receiving core that Auburn had a year ago, but, um, you know, a lot of inexperience there. But, you know, Kobe Hudson came along. I mean, they, they've had guys who come along this year. But, um, man, I just, like, I, I couldn't help but say in watching that game, like, dude, I know you're not healthy, but you look like a completely different quarterback than you did a year ago at LSU. Yeah, and some of the things that are the most concerning about Finley and what we saw with him on Tuesday – was in the past we've seen Auburn quarterbacks kind of stall out and not be able to move the football because receivers couldn't get separation. That's been a very consistent theme over the last decade at Auburn is guys just not able to get open. But against Houston, guys got open. Guys got an extra step or two on receivers. And there were a few of those that should have been touchdown passes. If you have any sort of touch on the ball or any sort of consistency whatsoever, that's kind of what you would expect. And you're right. Every now and then, Finley would... But, you know, he'll lay one in there and it's like, wow, that was a good catch, but it was a pretty good throw. That's a tough throw to make and he'd make it. But just the consistency is, is terrible. Like it's been really, really bad. And I don't think it's all his fault. I don't think the offensive line is great. But from a receiving standpoint, as much as Auburn fans like to blame things on the receivers, you, I don't think you can do that with what happened on Tuesday. Yeah, I, I, I almost am willing to go this far, Zach, and make a bold prediction because yeah. I love to make bold predictions. Me too. Uh, I'll make a bold prediction that TJ Finley is not back in an Auburn uniform next season. Um, you know, transfer portal, we're seeing guys move all over the place. Austin Davis is now going to come in and, you know, obviously it's, it's going to be his gig. Brian Harson handpicked him and said, this is my guy to come in and be in my off, be my offensive coordinator. I think Auburn starting quarterback next year is not on the roster. Currently. I think right. they're going to go in the portal. Finley's going to enter the portal, go somewhere else. I think they're going to go in the portal and bring in somebody else. And I've heard rumblings that it could be an SEC guy. We'll see who it, who it ends up being. Uh, you know, my buddy in Houston texted me last night and said, Demetrius Davis time. I mean, he's very high on him. He watched him throughout his high school career. So, right. you know, whether it's Demetrius Davis, whether it's somebody that's out there who, who hasn't entered the portal yet, uh, keep in mind, you know, last year, they were quarterbacks entering as late as, you know, late in the summer entering the portal and joining their new schools. So a lot could happen this off season, but I just, I wonder about fit. And I wonder if, you know, TJ Finley was sold something and, you know, they didn't follow the coaching staff, didn't follow through and coach him up very well. And maybe it's best for both sides to kind of part ways this off season. Well, that was the story in the conversation when, you know, the first few articles about Finley showing interest at Auburn came out and there are quotes of him saying, yeah, I sat down with Harson and the coaching staff and, you know, they're looking for me to come in and compete for the starting job. And it's like, did Harson tell him that? Like, is that something that they're actually saying? Because, like, that's fascinating. Um, and it seemed like that was true to some extent. But, yeah, I'm kind of with you. Like, once Bo got the job, did they just drop him all together? And, and you mentioned the Georgia State drive. It just makes the decision to bench Bo Nix in that game even more fascinating with all the information that we have now, and as you know, it doesn't look like Finley really fits in this style of offense the way it currently sits, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, but what was that decision then? Like he, right. he must've just been fed up with, with what Bo was doing. And then to go back to Bo, just with all the information now, of this first full season in the books, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it makes it much more significant in my mind. And the ironic part about that was they were going to LSU that next week and everybody was setting up. Yes. The, I think even you and I talked and we were setting up the whole storyline of TJ Finley going back to Baton Rouge. Lo and behold, Bo Nix starts and Bo Nix becomes Johnny Manziel that night down double digits. And he leads Auburn from behind. He's un, unsackable like LSU's getting to him. They just can't bring him down. And Bo Nix puts on a show and beats LSU in Death Valley for the first time in, in forever. So yeah, it was it was kind of interesting how the season went along, but I just wonder because after that, you know, you talk about losses uh, against Georgia, Mississippi State, South Carolina, Alabama, all these rough losses this year. Like, would any of those have been different if Finley had been the guy the rest of the way? Would we have seen more consistency from Finley if he had been, uh, you know, the guy from that point in the season yeah. rather than when Bo gets hurt? And you'd have to think he would have been a little bit better, right? If, if he was able to stay in, keep that momentum. Because in that LSU game, Bo started, and then they gave Finley a drive, and that was it. And yeah. it's like, that's weird. Why'd you do that? Once again, in hindsight with everything, like that doesn't make any sense at all. So, um, but yeah, man, it, it's, it's, it's bonkers. Like it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But it is 
Uh, it is what it is. I'm with you. and I would not be shocked if Finley left, but I don't know. He ha- he would have to sit out another year because he already used his free transfer. Yeah. So, so how does that play into things? And also, Gordy, I'm not entirely convinced that Auburn is going to be able to land a top-notch transfer quarterback for the 2022 season just because if I'm a quarterback interested in transferring, I'm going to want proof that you've got a decent offensive line and you've got weapons to throw to. And I just don't think Auburn can really compete with that sales pitch right now. Well, define top-notch quarterback. I mean, who's who's available? And I'll just throw this out there. Somebody said to me that they think it will be a quarterback from the SEC that has not entered the portal yet. Yeah, And that just got me thinking. I'm like, well, we've already know of a handful who've entered the portal. You got the Calzone, your favorite, Zach Calzada at Texas A&M right. is in the portal. We got Connor Basilak at Missouri. We've got Amory Jones at Florida. Mm-hmm. We've got guys in the conference who have all already entered the portal and don't know where they're going to end up. Are any of those guys, you know, like if you had to pick right out, TJ Finley or Connor Paisley, TJ Finley or Emory Jones, like are any of those surefire upgrades and say, man, we're going to be really good at quarterback with that guy? I would definitely take Emory over Finley. Um, I think I would take Calzada over Finley as well. Be Am better. I on base on that? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So we'll see. Um, if Calzada comes to Auburn, which I don't think he's going to, there's got to be there's got to be a local restaurant in town that names a calzone after him. That has to happen, or I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind, Gordy. <laughs> hey, I, I want to get your thoughts in just a moment on. Okay, Harson's got one year in the SEC. How's the conference viewing him? Uh, in just a moment, right here on this locked on crossover action, Gordy. You know it. I know it. The best place to place all of your sports bets is BetOnline.ag. Whether you're wagering on you know, this bowl season or the NFL as it's heating up towards the college football playoff or, or the NFL, uh, the NFL playoffs, whatever it may be, betonline.ag is the way to put your money where your mouth is. They've got a new design website, whether it's on mobile or on your computer. Check it out, betonline.ag. And when you make that first deposit, use promo code locked on to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Betonline.ag, where the game starts. Yeah, so Harson goes six and seven, Gordy, in his first year as an SEC head coach. Where where is Auburn currently in your mind as far as tiers in the SEC? Well, I mean, you can't help but think back to you know you and I talked right after the win over Ole Miss, and right. I mean we're you know we're talking a win over a top ten team. We're talking you know everything still to play for for Auburn at that point in the season. You're six and two. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were, we were even talking about the possibility of winning out. You know, the, the, the thing that seemed most unlikely at that point was, uh, you're probably going to lose in the iron bowl, but like that one ended up being the most winnable game Almost of, all, of all the rest of ones, uh, the ones down the stretch. Like it's crazy to think you went from six and two to six and seven, you lost five straight games and, you know, a couple of them in there. I mean, were you know, the A&M game, it felt like you know, that one in the second half, you did nothing to even compete in that game. Right. Uh, the Iron Bowl hurts the most because you had them beat and and you you let it slip away. But, you know, when I look around the SEC, Zach, it's hard to think like everybody in Tennessee is very optimistic about Hypo right now mm-hmm. and, and Hendon Hooker coming back. Everybody in South Carolina is optimistic about Shane Beamer. You know, he exceeded expectations already in year one. But yeah, Zoo, right. Zoo, they kind of rallied a little bit and won a couple games they weren't supposed to down the stretch. So people are feeling a little bit better about Eli Drinkwitz. They got a top 15 recruiting class now. So, like, I look around at them and then the Billy Napier and Brian Kelly, I think both Florida and LSU feel good about their hires. Right. I start to look around and outside of Vanderbilt, Zach, I don't know if anybody feels as down on their team. Maybe Mike Leach and losing the way they did to Texas Tech just – I mean, just an ass kicking in the second half of that game, yeah. but they're still pretty like, okay, we're still feeling pretty good about Mike Leach moving forward. Um, man, like I would say Auburn is probably the one that feels most pessimistic about their position right now and their head coach. Yeah. And so the question is, can you fix everything you need to fix in the course of an off season? And with the transfer portal, like it's definitely easier to do that now than it ever has been. But on the flip side, everybody else is doing that too. Um, Auburn, I think, needs some help at linebacker. We saw Cam Riley kind of be the next guy. He looks pretty good on Tuesday. 
the longer it takes Owen Papo to make an official decision, a public decision one way or the other, I think the more likely it is that he comes back. So I think that's good. Your linebacker core is going to be solid. I think your corner situation is good. You got the number one Juco corner in the country coming in. I think that's helpful. Uh, same with the number one Juco safety coming in. It's just, can you get an offensive line? And people say, well, you got to hit the transfer portal for offensive linemen. You got to do it. It's like, well, everyone is doing that. And there's not that many good transfer offensive linemen. There's not a whole lot of great offensive linemen anyway. And so whenever a team needs a good offensive lineman, they're also getting calls from the top tier programs that have a chance to win a championship. Your Ohio States, your Bama's, your, your Georgia's, and you know, I'll even throw Clemson in there, even though they had a bad season. But all these guys, all everyone wants good offensive linemen, Gordy. And so how is Auburn going to position themselves to get better offensive linemen? I don't know if it's as easy just to saying, hey, well, yeah, they're going to go out and get good transfer offensive linemen because there's just not many of them. Yeah, let me give you a, a couple of names to keep an eye on because I was reading up on some of these guys this morning. And okay. granted, the schools they're coming from won't wow you a lot, but these are just some of the guys that, that people are looking at in the transfer portal. That, guy that, named that, that, that's what Auburn and other schools that are in that tier are going to have to do, right? They're going to have to take kind of a risk on some of these smaller school guys. Sure. Uh, there's a guy, Curtis Dunlap at Minnesota, um, offensive lineman. I know some people have eyes on. Uh, Traymond Shorts at East Tennessee State. He's another one that people think could could make that leap being at a small school. Mason Brooks at Western Kentucky is another one. And the last one coming from the Ivy League, Cornell Hunter Norzad. Um, you know, LSU dipped into the Ivy League a couple of years ago and got their starting center from Harvard. And he started the last two years at the center spot for LSU. So it's not crazy to think you can make a leap from the Ivy League to the SEC, but those are just four names that have been thrown out there of guys that are in the portal that are very highly thought of. I think the athletic has them, you know, ranked in their top 15 of yeah. transfer portal guys. So, I mean, that's where I would start. I would start with phone calls to all four of those guys. Again, does Austin Davis have any ties to anybody around the country coming in that, you know, he can maybe talk to and say, here's what we're doing. But in my mind, Auburn's got the best thing to sell. Look, we got Tank Bigsby, <laughs> you know, you want to run block for Tank Bigsby? We'll, we'll put you on. You'll start right away. So, um, and for Tank Bigsby, he's looking at this going, look, man, I kind of had one foot in the portal, one foot not. Like, you guys want to keep me around here. You better uh, bring in some big hogs that can block for me and uh, get this thing going. I know Arkansas, speaking of hogs, they had a couple of their guys who were kind of di dilly-dallying with the, with the portal. So, man, why not reach across to another SEC West opponent and say, I know you're back a backup in Arkansas right now. Why don't you come to Auburn where you can start? So, uh, yeah, I think a whole retooling of this whole line next year needs to happen for Auburn. Yeah, and they may have to get creative and take some risk on some dudes. But you've got the amount of spots, scholarships available to take risks. Get as many as you can and find the best five. Gordy, you mentioned Tank Bigsby. Obviously, Auburn having Tank Bigsby, one of the better running backs in, in college football. From your perspective, kind of from just, you know, you watch Auburn from a conference point of view. When it's crunch time and he's not in the game, what's going through your mind? Because that happens seemingly every time there's a close contest. Yeah, stupid. I mean, he was he was the, he was their best playmaker in the Birmingham Bowl. I mean, when you look at it, nearly 100 yards rushing, they're you know the leading rusher and leading receiver in the game. I mean, that that 51 yard play, uh, I forget if it was a screen or a wheel route or what it was, but whatever it was, it was like, hey, run more of that. Like that's that's a play that gets T.J. Finley comfortable because it's an easy throw. He's got blockers in front of him. He's out running everybody. Like I, I just, it, it's mind boggling at times this year where you know big moment in the game and tag bigsby is either not in the game or not getting the ball it just you know Br brian harson we're we're overthinking this dude like uh, you know and i thought that was most disappointing too in the bowl game like all right bobo is gone this is harson's show to right. show what he can do offensively and it looked like the same offense but like it was like dude did you just take mike bobo's playbook and you just like you called plays out of that like Where's I, the I liked it more until the fourth quarter. The two yeah. touches for Tank in the fourth quarter doesn't make sense to me. But I liked his design of attacking the edges of the defense because that's where Auburn kind of had the advantage and all that. I, I liked that. To me, it looked a little bit different. Um, but still, in the fourth quarter, it looked like the same stuff. Yeah, I, I just that, – that, that was frustrating to me. And so, again, you know, when we talk about optimism and big picture of looking yeah. ahead, yeah, I think Auburn fans are sitting here going – wait, we bought out Gus for this? Like this, you know, this is what we, we thought we were getting better 
uh, in, in paying all that money to buy out Gus. And I think right now, you know, we'll see what happens in the other bowl games. But I, I'd say even if Sam Pittman were to lose to Penn State, even if uh, Ole Miss were to lose to Baylor, I, I don't think any of those teams are going to be down on their coaches if they lose their bowl games more than Auburn fans right now are questioning Brian Harson. I think there's optimism, uh, you know, a mound for all the other coaches around the SEC. Maybe Eli Drinkwitz, I put a step below Brian Harson, but mm-hmm. that's about it. And Clark Lee's down there too at Vandy. But I think everybody else, the arrow's pointing upward. That's not good. That is not good from an Auburn point of view. Gordy, where can people find you, hear you, all that good stuff? Yeah, Locked on SEC, wherever you find your podcast, talking all things SEC. We've had some great uh, conversations with some current SEC players, Vanderbilt quarterback Ken Seals, LSU quarterback Miles Brennan. We'll be talking some SEC baseball here very soon as well, so we'll have some guys on from across the conference. Looking forward to that. Awesome. Awesome. And if folks listening uh, to Locked on SEC, for all your Auburn content every single day, Locked on Auburn. We'll see you soon right here on the Locked on Podcast Network.